welcome everybody. Welcome to the Sunday at Grace 360. We are so glad to have you here. It's an amazing day uh, that the Lord has given us as well. We also want to welcome everyone who is watching and streaming. Hi, mi amor, you're there watching me. And um, well, we want to bring some announcements today. And one of them is that, don't forget, we continue to have on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Inner Lux study of the Bible that will continue even though uh, Mike is in Paraguay. I believe he continues to do very faithfully the study. So please keep up with it. You, any of those of you who are watching, a part of my wife, because I know that we're not doing it now. But if you have the chance to continue doing the Bible study, keep up because it's very, very interesting. At the same time, uh, we also want to remember that we have a, our very beloved family, the Goddards, in Paraguay. So we can lift them up in prayer uh, before the Lord. So the Lord will continue to do His work with them, using them, and all the people that they're meeting down there in, in the south in Paraguay. Let's pray and let's put this time before the Lord. Let's worship together. Let's praise our God and give him thanks for all the things that he has given us up to this point. Very, we are very glad to have you here with us. Oh, good Lord. Thank you for the amazing opportunity to count with another day of life. We are so, so privileged to count with you, to know that we are your children, that we know that we count with your love, your blessings, and all love what you desired and entrusted us. We are just in, in an amaze and awe of the things that you have given us, Lord, and we want to, to answer you back in obedience, love, honoring you, the Lord, and continue to be faithful as you request from us. So please, Lord, receive this moment of praise, of worship that we want to bring before you. Thank you for each one of my brethren who are sitting here with me which have the will to continue blessing your name, honoring you and servicing, giving service to you, Lord, as well for all of those who are watching stream, Lord, uh, whether it's here, it's here in the States or overseas, we thank you for them and thank you for keep um, making bigger your family, Lord. In the Lord's name, we, pl we pray this. Amen. So this, this next point in our service is on spotlights on missions. And there are two things I want to bring today. Uh, and the first of all is that we have the Goddard family at, in Paraguay for the next week or two, if I am not wrong. And they've already been there for at least two weeks. Um, especially uh, remembering because they are going to be the family this month, uh, the missions family, um, which we're bringing before the Lord and want to have a special treat with them during the month. So don't forget to always bring a word of encouragement, a hug, or a appreciation in any way that you can. And also giving thanks to the Lord for this amazing family who has done so much for our congregation and how the Lord is leading them into um, bring up our congregation in so many different ways. At the same time, we, I also wanted to bring to you part of a... Um, kind of update of what's going on in our ministry with my family, with the Delivery family. So uh, as many of you might know already, well, we began to raise our support to work with Ethno360 since summer of the last year. Since then, we've been able to see the Lord working in many different ways uh, at the point where we got to the 30% of our recommended support. However, in, there, in the process of getting up to there, there's been so many bumps in the road in which we don't stop to encounter. We are still another year away to be able to fulfill that goal, which we have for summer of, ne of next year, to be able to begin our ministry as part of the maintenance team there at the, Ethnos, uh, the Homes of Ethnos 360. Uh, part of that is that since this past month, we got three of our supporters uh, taking us down, unfortunately, uh, and another three of them that um, made a promise of starting supporting us didn't go through. So please help us to keep us in prayer as we continue to be faithful as well in terms of time, um, ideas, contacts, churches and different ways there where we can reach and continue to share the ministry that the Lord has brought us to. We continue to trust the Lord. It's uh, We understand it, it takes 
different approaches, takes different time. Mm, other, some people might do it faster, may get it quicker than others. That doesn't mean that the Lord is faithful with others and with others doesn't. But uh, we understand that it's just uh, a, a journey, a different journey for each one of us. And we are just glad that the Lord has brought us up to the point where we are. And we want to thank you as well as our congregation for standing in front of us and, and uh, helping us to reach our goal to serve the Lord with ethnos. So we continue to be diligent. We continue to trust the Lord in whatever uh, the time will be for us to reach that goal uh, of the either the minimum support that we need to begin at the ministry or the full support that we they're requesting for us, for our family to be able to be in ministry. So if anything else changes regarding that, we will let you know. In the meantime, we also had uh, had, had so many, uh, a lot of treats from the Lord as well. One of those is that the Lord has helped us to be more decisive and um, and know better which direction we would like to take in terms of our ministry overseas whenever that happens. And it's been reaching the Middle East. We might tell you later exactly what country we're thinking about, but um, we think the Lord is being very clear about it, and we're starting to take in steps into towards that direction. The Lord allowed us to meet these precious uh, pastoral couple from a church and an Arabic church, which we've been attending for at least two or three Sundays in the past. Everything is in Arabic, so there's not too much that I can share with you because there's very little that I understand. But it's been nice because we've been able to put into practice some of the things that we learned during the training uh, to learn language and culture. And it's been nice to approach learning some things, some phrases, sentences, and things like that, and be able to communicate them with the pastor and people in the congregation, as well for being able to do outreach in Sanford with people with an Islamic background, uh, making relationships. Like yesterday that I met uh, for the first time a family that comes from Afghanistan with a Muslim background, willing to hear from the Lord, uh, willing to share what they know about their religion, but at the same time an open gate to to bring them before before the Lord and and well, my having a a new a new brother in in Christ. So things like that that encourage us uh, along the process of our ministry. Uh, we're just so thankful to the Lord because in the meantime, uh, even though we haven't got to the point where we we would like to be, we're enjoying so many things. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. We really appreciate it in so many ways. Job support in, in different many ways. Well, thank you for that. And let's pray. Let's just use this time to pray, uh, especially for the Goddards. One of the things I was discussing with uh, a very good friend of ours between Mike and I, it's Pastor Carlos. You might know him, most of you, from the Hispanic Church in Westview. And him and I came into accordance that both of us are jealous of Mike in a good way. Because when we look at his pictures and everything that is going on there, he looks very happy, very joyful, glad, uh, enthusiastic about what he's doing there, bold in so many ways. I, I feel proud of him. I, I don't know you, but I, it's just a blessing to see the Goddard family, the way they're ministering the Lord and the service that they're giving, not only here, but there in Paraguay with so many supporters and, uh, and people that they're working with in their teams. So let's pray for them. Oh, good Lord and Father, we thank you once again for having this amazing privilege to come before you, not being ashamed because of the blood of Jesus, that we can come before you, Lord, and knowing that we are fully forgiven in the cross, Lord. We want to bring before you and lift our um, very, very dearly family, the Goddards, Thank you for each one of them, for Mike, for Trisha, for the kids, for Mike, for Caleb, for Leah, and also Mr. Dean, that it's with them in the team there. And for all the people as well who they're ministering with, all their teamwork, thank you for the way that you are using them. We ask you for your special blessing during this time in their trip and the people they're ministering to, the churches, the villages, 
people and teams that they are connected with and all of those who are who they are encouraging to continue their work and also to expand the work of your ministry lord and the missions that they're doing all around the globe we thank you so much for uh, giving us the chance to to see what you're doing through them and we feel part of that and we just bless your name lord for being allowed to see this here on earth we bless your name in christ jesus amen all right and i don't know if i will feel comfortable enough to do it sitting down here while i preach but i'll just give it a try um yeah well i'm not gonna start running all, all the way along because i know i have certain space where i can't move from <laughs> all right let's try both of them <laughs> There is a something very nice about the book that I've been reading lately. Uh, finally, I finished at least part of the book of Isaiah as I was reading it, reading through it. But now I started a kind of a studies uh, through the books of Samuel, first and second Samuel, and I've encountered so many things in the book of Samuel that yeah, I didn't see before. Right, like every time that you approach the Bible, you read a book that you I'm sure you probably have read for about 50 or 60 times or who knows how many more times, but you never stop finding jewels and things that uh, they're just so fitted for the th times that you live in the moment that you are reading them that that lets that just allows me to see a wise and all sovereign God over our lives that he's in control of every single thing that happens in our lives. And still, even though if we might not do it in the best way or we are not taking into account every single detail, he is still merciful and full of grace towards us. At least that's how I see it in my life. I, I really hope that you can see him in the same way or even more than that because it's just so so much full of grace towards us and we, we really don't deserve that. So part of that testimony and what the Lord has been bringing up for, for me and my family with this book of Samuel brought a lot of memories to my mind. One of them was a very interesting <laughs> in, an anecdote in my life when be, before I married Stephanie. So you, you, I'm not sure how much you know of our, uh, our testimony, but so just for you to know, I know Stephanie White, or I met Stephanie probably about 15 or 16 years ago. That's half of my life. I'm only 31 years old. And I met her when I was 14 years old. And I dated her for at least seven or eight years, years before we get married. When I met her, I was not a Christian. In fact, none of us came from a Christian family. None of us had a va Christian values in our homes. I would say rather that we had a lot of a, a incredible and weird blend of religions, beliefs, system values, and so many things on and on in our lives in, in, in each one of our families that it was hard to keep up and understand what we actually believed. However, in part of that, when I met the Lord and we started to have a purpose as a couple looking forward to honor the Lord in marriage, uh, I've always been characterized as someone who likes to do, to like to make things happen right away. I am a very impatient person. I don't know if that shows up, but I, I always thought I was a patient person before I actually had my kids then I really understand and I was able to notice and began to be aware that I was very an impatient person because I was always, you know, very kind and resilient with different things and especially with people out of my doors, you know, because sometimes it's easier to be things that are well seen out of the doors of your house rather than the, with the ones that are in your house. And that was something that I was able to see. I mean, like everybody at my, at my job site when I used to work in Colombia, everybody was always saying, like, oh, Santiago is so kind and patient and he's always being so generous and nice with all the clients and things like that. But when I got home, I was sometimes so irritated and angry. And that was a complete opposite person of who was being outside. In all of those stories, 
when I wanted to pursue marriage with, with Stephanie, we were congregated at that time at a Christian Missionary Alliance in Bogota, the church where we knew for first the gospel and we heard about the Lord. And I was just so, so bold to ask the pastor, Pastor, I want to ask Stephanie for marriage right now. And he said to me, like, you're not ready. But uh, for me, that wasn't, that wasn't really the right answer. So it actually happened to be that I wasn't even expecting him to agree with me for me to do it. Even though he said I wasn't ready, I didn't care. I went for it. And what I found out is that even though I had a good intention in my heart to honor the Lord in marriage with my future wife, I was going over so many suggestions and, and thoughts from people who I really cared and wanted to see me and my future family in a good, um, in a good way, in a, that we would have a good future, that things would come along in a right, in right and righteous way. But I didn't hear those things. I just wanted to do the things on my own and just step in as quick as I could. So I did. The other bad part, and Stephanie can tell you about this, is that when I called my uh, when I called Stephanie's family, they were living in a in another city, ten hours away from the capital city where I was living. So I was arranging all these trips with uh, like four or five friends of ours in common that we will show up show up in his, in her house, so we can have a big party because she we were going to celebrate her birthday. And on the night of, their birth, on her, of her birthday, I was going to uh, propose to her. So we got all together. I got the money. I ended up inv inviting most of all of them because they didn't have em enough money. I don't even know how I got the money from. But the other thing was that when I called my fam uh, Stephanie's family, I didn't want to talk to my father-in-law because I know he was a very, very um, rough person. He comes from a military background. Um, I always knew that he was not going to be, he wasn't going to agree with it because we were too young and this and that. So, you know what? I just didn't talk to him. And then I didn't tell him. I just talked to my mother-in-law and told him, I am planning this, this and that. And he, and she said, yeah, sure, go ahead. But I asked, I asked her to, but just please don't tell my, don't tell your husband I'm coming. <laughs> and, you know, Everything came to be the way I just, I planned it. I got there. He was all surprised. What's going on? She, she as well. And at, at the end, the short, short, long, short story, I ended up proposing to her. And of course, he got very angry to me because uh, I didn't honor his, his authority over her, uh, over his, his daughter. And so many, so many things and on that I did wrong that after that I had to, just to regret and then do it in the right way. So uh, we actually have a story of two proposals. I have to propose her twice because then I had to repent and ask forgiveness to, forgiveness to all of those who I did wrong. And then we did it the right way because my mom wasn't even present at the moment too. Well, the reason why I tell this story is because it has to do a lot with the story I am about to tell you. And the story that we are about to, to talk about, it's... Uh, written in 2 Samuel chapter 6 from verses 5 to 15. And as you might see the image there, I titled the sermon, God's Understanding God's Leading Hand. Um, because sometimes we think we know what's God's purpose or God's uh, will on our lives, but we need to understand before we actually step in on, into what we think it's His will. Uh, not because we don't know it, but we might just missing many details and jumping over those details and then regretting over, uh, going over those details, not going over those details. So let's read about that and, and let's find out what I actually want to share with you about that. So let's go again from verses 5 to 15, chapter number 6. It says, verse number 5. Uh, I am reading from the ESV version, okay? 
and David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when, they, and when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Verse 7, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken against Uzzah. In that place it's called Perez Uzzah. To this day, and David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, "How can the ark of the Lord came to me? Come to me?" So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained at the, on the in the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household. Verse twelve, and it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed Edom and all, the belongs, and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox in fattened, uh, a fattened animal, and David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. Let be his word blessed. So this is a very famous story, uh, the life of David. Actually, at some point, a very um, uh, a story that leaves you sometimes puzzled. Because I remember the first time when I read it, I really see the reason why would God allow something so bad to happen to a person which was just literally not letting the ark to fall down from the, the cart it was being written from. But um, there, is an, there is a lot of things that when I kept just reading on, you could find the reason why God had to be so earnestly clear about why he did it and why it was so important for him to make everybody understand three important things were that we are going to read here. This story is not only being written in the second book of Samuel, but the same story it's found in the first book of Chronicles, chapter 13, in which the story is told kind of almost in the same way, but it tells us a little bit of more details one of those details that I want to bring up is that before David actually intended to bring the ark to uh, Jerusalem, which was recently being conquered uh, by the kingdom of Israel against the uh, Jebusites, I believe it's, uh, that's the way you say it, they wanted to bring the ark from Shiloh. At the beginning, it was in Shiloh, and if some of you remember, before King Saul, King David, the ark was once brought into battle because the Israelites were having a battle, battle be, a, before the, in, with the Philistines. And they were losing, and, that they, and they thought that the best way of winning the battle was bringing the ark of God, bringing the very presence of the Lord in the, in the battlefield so they could win, and they end up losing, and the Philistines steal the ark of the, of the covenant and take them to their to their country, and many things happen on and on. What happens is that the ark is never actually be taken care of because it was laid on Abinadab's house for a long time, I believe like even 20 years before it's been taken care of, but before that was in Shiloh in the tent that it was meant for it to remain where all the priests could go and do their service according to how the law established it for them. Then, at that point where David, it's in all his power, he just conquered the city of David. There are so many things going on and on that he wants to bring the very presence of God to the city where he is about to begin reigning. So, he used to reign in another city called Hebron, like only five miles away from Jerusalem. 
But now that he's king over the city of David, where it's Jerusalem, he wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant with him. So why not just to bring it, no matter how, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant in any way, and let's just keep the presence of the Lord in the city where the king is supposed to rule. So that's basically the idea of what David wanted to do. He was building houses for himself. He was building a kingdom. And for sure, he didn't want to leave aside the presence of the Lord and the service of the Lord in his tabernacle. So that's why he wanted to bring the ark to Jerusalem. But there's one of the things that David encountered for first that will make him realize why it was so drastic and so spontaneous to bring the ark in the way that he did. One of them is that David wasn't probably um, aware of God's holiness. And when we talk about God's holiness, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of threat to God in there. Because we all know that God is a holy God. That God is not a man to repent. And it's not a sinner because he is holy of holiness. But at the same time, when we are, we as, as his children, we as his followers, we tend to forget that w even us don't fully understand the holiness of the Lord and that we just may overpass very simple but strong realities about his holiness. This is something that David encountered at the moment when Oza touched the ark of the Lord and he was struck dead right away. Don't ask me if it was a thunder or ray or who knows what we don't know the the word doesn't say anything about it but he just lay dead and there is very something important and i don't know if you know about this but the guy who just died was his um nephew he was related to him abinadab was his second oldest brother and abinadab was the father of this of this 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 guy uza one of the ones that were riding the ark with them. So just imagine this. You are the king of the kingdom. You were for sure doing something nice and, and worthy of honor, bringing the ark of the covenant to put it and keep it in a place where it, will has its, uh, where it belongs and where the service can be fulfilled, the sacrifice that were so important for uh, for the matter of continuing their daily life before honoring the Lord and continue to to do all the the Levitical um, laws and things like this, but then at, at, at the mo at the le least expected moment he lies down dead. He it was it was his relative. He was doing something according to him well, and he didn't know what happened. So this takes us to somewhere else where we, we need to understand why was this happening. The story all tells us there that he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant riding on an ark, like an, uh, on a cart, sorry. On an ark that was pulled by oxen. So you got these oxen pulling the cart, taking it to its place, and when they arrived at a place where it says there was a threshing floor, which is incredible because every time they usually read threshing floors, like where they're found in these places, it's meant to tell that there is a trial to encounter. Because you know what is threshing, right? When you are putting the weed and trying to kind of grind the seeds and leaving out the, um, the chef, that's the word, thank you. Um, my English is not that beyond. So <laughs> the chef and, and taking the good part for eating and leaving the other one aside, which is a illustration of how we are supposed to be holy and put away sin from our lives. But at that very moment, precisely at that very moment where he was going over that part, ended up where this whole trial situation uh, confronts David. Because to be honest, the problem was more for David than it was for Uzzah. Well, he yes, he's dead. Nothing else. There's nothing else that we we can do about it. He's no longer going to be with us. But David was the one who remained it with the hardship, with the burden in his heart. What is he's going to tell to his brother? Oh, I'm sorry, brother. I didn't know what I was doing, and your son is dead. Um, 
there were there were surrounded for at least 30,000 people with them. I don't know if you remember what we were reading, but it says that there was a party going on at the same time while they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant. And if you've ever gone to uh, nowadays churches where they have loud worship music, or if you've gone to uh, First Street here in uh, downtown Sanford where when there is a special uh, event or things like that where they have live music and that, boy, they, they know how to make loud music and people is yelling because they can't understand each other and, and doing things. Okay, that is in a, like in an earthly manner, but just think of the loudness of the time where they were using lyres and, and tambourines and people dancing in front of the Ark of the Covenant because they were just happy. I mean, it was, it was a time to rejoice for what was going on. It was, a, it was an epic moment for the nation of Israel. And all of a sudden, one of the very important persons just lies dead. So you can understand that God wants to teach something David, uh, important about his holiness. And one of the main points about this is that God's leading hand will change our under, will change us to understand how is his, his guidance, first of all, because we, his holiness help us to understand what it's God's will. So God's holiness, Help us to understand what is His will. What is God's will? Why is that? Let me tell you. Let me share with you a couple of verses. We have one of them, which is Exodus 40, where the glory of God was manifested on the Ark of the Covenant. When the tabernacle was erected on the desert, it says that day and night the presence, the physical, or or at least the the um, the side of the viewable or the the a physical presence of the Lord was able to be seen coming down from the sky on a fire tornado or in a cloud that remained over the Ark of the Covenant day and night. That was leading them. That was telling them that He was there. That that was serious and He was not to be messed up with, because He made it very clear. What were what was his determination and his and his commitments and laws for everybody to follow and keep very closely because he is holy. He expects us to to uh, follow every decree that he wants us to to follow on that. Then we have another verse, and because of the sake of time, sake of time, I'm not going to read them, but I'm going to tell you what they say. That it's in First of Kings chapter 19, verses 11 to 13. And that's the story where Elisha is being taken uh, by the Lord to a mountain, to a risk, um, to a cliff, sorry, where he is there and he sees different things going on, a fire. I believe there is a mountain that it's um, shaking. And there, there, there is also a, a breeze that comes by him. And the Lord tells him that he is in the breeze. And also that tells us about the tenderness of the holiness of the Lord, in which even though he is consuming fire, uh, perfection, all power, all knowing, and all powerful, he's still a tender whisper that can guide our lives, that cares about us, and that knows all of our ways, just as it was shown in Jesus in the way that he treated his disciples and everyone who was around on him. Uh, just being um, willing to serve them, clean them, heal them. That's, a whole, that's the holiness of the Lord that he wants us to understand. And, and whenever we get to understand that, that shapes our view of God and also shapes the manner we want to, we want to approach him. And we, this is what I found it's very interesting. Once that you get acquainted with all these things and you put them in your heart, and you are, you are mold, you are shaped by them. You don't proceed the same way you used to. So I'm very sure that this encounter, very strong in southern, in southern encounter from day, of David with God, was going to shape him f from now on. He was not going to be the same person from now on. And all, 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 one other, other of them, which is very important, 
when they were in Mount Sinai and all the nation of Israel just barely got, gotten out from the slavery in Egypt were able to see the mountain crumbling down and uh, throwing fire and thunder because the presence of the Lord was on the top of the mountain and where they were so afraid they, they, that they couldn't even approach as the Lord asked them to do and they asked the Moses to go in front of them because they were very afraid of the holiness of the Lord. So just a, um, a few verses that will help us remind and, and to understand how the Lord is holy, how he presents he present himself towards us and wants us to um, make us understand how this must uh, or how he wants us to to be shaped in the in in the truth that is being shown to us. So the the thing here with David was that David was supposed to us the Levites to request them to carry the ark of the covenant from whatever it was in the house of Abinadab back to Jerusalem when he wanted to wanted to keep it. Uh, to begin all the services uh, in the in the new temple that he was willing to to build, but at the end he didn't build, but his son did. So this second part is going to tell us about that not only the holiness of the Lord help us to understand His will, but as well that there is an order given by the Lord that help us understand His will. So David understood that because of God, it's so holy, and you cannot just approach to Him as a normal human, not coming before Christ and being cleansed by the blood of the Lord, uh, of the Lord and not expecting to you to fall dead, which is exactly what happened to his nephew. Now, he, he, gets, he understands that the, there was a right order to prevent uh, that to happen. And it was that he never came to the right people asking to do what he was supposed to do. And it was that the Levites would carry the ark whatever distance was needed to be taken. So it could be the, pur the purpose of the Lord could be accomplished. I was looking at it into a map. And from the place where the ark of the covenant was, was located and to Jerusalem was more than 12 miles or around 12 mi miles of distance walking and we are not talking about in a fast paced walking like these sport that some of you might seen that people don't it's not really even walking they're like almost trotting when they're moving their heels and their and their and their feet but this is the type of of move of pace where there is a lot of people dancing in the back there's another ones with instruments in the front there's animals carrying heavy stuff it was at least going to take take them probably three or four day, days to reach their their location. So it was a long travel, but even though it was long and it was take a long play a, a long time, the Lord had provided a way to do the things in the right way, and that makes me remember of my story that even though I waited for so long to marry Stephanie and to propose her. I could have waited just a little bit more if I wanted to to do the things in the right way and ask my father-in-law and then talk to the pastor once again and maybe wait in a little bit more to, to know what he wanted me to wait on that or not. I mean, because we get distracted very easily by things that have a, a spiritual title, but when we want to when we want to put them put them into practice. It's very easily to be stray from the right purpose. And then we think we did something right and we then, then we don't understand why God is, being, is doing what he's doing with us. But at the end, we end up understanding that, okay, Lord, I'm sorry, now I understand that I should have done things in the right way. Not because the purpose or the destination was a evil thing itself, but it's because the Lord is interested in the process that has with us. Because He cares more for our hearts than to whatever Tim or Wendell or Dan or Miss Karen will be at, at the end of, of this journey. Because we all know what's going to be the end of the journey. We know that we are all going to be 
called saints. We've been already washed by the blood of the of the of the Lamb. We're gonna be before the Lord. We're gonna be worship Him, and we are already there as we've been studying in Ephesians. We have nothing to worry about uh, of the end of the times because we've been placed on those in, in, in be, we've been sitting in those places already. But in the meantime, He cares of our journey and our walk because He is shaping a heart that is being shaped too long by the um, by the sinful nature to turn it into a holy nature in which we already have the um, like the promises of it in the holy spirit but he wants to continue um that we practice and train our lives so the day when he comes he feels honored with our way of walk and that we may bring others to the lord because only in the way that we practice our life daily with the Lord, is that the others will be get interested to know who is Jesus, not just because what we tell them about the Bible says about Jesus, but when they actually see it in our lives. So then that's what happened. When you read, and let's go ahead and, and read that part. Let's go to First Chronicles chapter number 15. And it says from verses, hold on a minute, 1 to 15. Let's go through it very quick. It says, David built houses for himself in the city of David, <clears throat> and he prepared the place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said that no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God, for the Lord had chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister to him forever. And David assembled all Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. And David gathered together the sons of Aaron and the Levites, of the sons of Kohath, Uriel. And let's just jump a little bit over all those names and the different Levites that, that were there. Verse number 12, and said to them, you are the heads of the fathers' house of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, you and your brothers so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place that I have prepared for it. Because you did not carry it first time, but the Lord, our God, broke out against us because we did not seek him according to the rule. So the priestess and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles, as Moses had commanded according to to the word of the Lord. All of that to bring us up to this very moment where he got to understand that there is a order in which our hearts are, are firstly shaped by the holiness of the Lord because we understand that we as a sinful as a sinful humanity, even though they have been cleansed by the Lord of, uh, by the blood of Jesus, God's still in His throne, and sometimes we don't we don't approach Him in the right in the right way. Yes, we're seated with Christ. Yes, we have all His blessings, but we continue to develop a an attitude of awe and respect towards of, of our God because we continue to know Him. We haven't yet encountered to understand all the mysteries of the Lord unto what what He meant for us, His holiness, and how we manage ourselves and behave ourselves before Him. So David understood this, and then he started to put it into practice, because because of it, he also understood that there was a right order for doing the things. And he just said it in those two chapters after what actually had happened. Who knows how long it passed? Oh yeah, no, we actually know. It, it passed at three months, because it says that the Ark of the Covenant remained of the house of Obed Edom, a Gittite, for three months, and his house was amazingly blessed. It doesn't say if it was blessed financially or in health wise or who knows in what term he said he was blessed, but it said he was blessed. This to remember that not because that happened with Uzzah, with David's nephew, that the Lord is only a God of wrath and in uh, willing to submit uh, to give to give people what they deserve, 
but also a God of willing to bless his people, willing to bless to any of those who are around his presence. And Obed-Edom was, uh, was able to see God's blessing in many ways. That could have meant that he finally understood what was his purpose in life, because uh, some chapters after, that same Obed-Edom is told to be one of the gatekeepers of the temple of, of Israel. But he, it says he's a Gittite. You know who, are, who were the Gittites? The same people from, the, from whom um, the giant um, whom David uh, battled against with, uh, Goliath. He came from the same town as Goliath came. He was a Gittite. And how he ended up being one of the gatekeepers and being added to the, to the, to the, um, to the Levites, it's unknown, but it's, it's, it's known as well that there were many, many uh, foreigners that were added into the nation of Israel and they started to, re to, to, do, all, to do works and to do as well, well uh, to honor the Lord in different acts of worship. And he was blessed. I don't know if that was his blessing, but I am very sure that when someone was in service to the Lord and had the chance to, uh, to gain his ballot, because he was also, I think, of, of luck to be able to, to serve the Lord in those times, he was incredibly blessed. And that was also something that they were was able to see, that even though that happened to him, it, it didn't mean that God was a mean God, God to him and to, to his family because what, what he allowed it to happen to him. But he was willing to show David and us that he is that he is real, and, and, and he he has made he wanted he wants to make it clear about his holiness and how we we should um, behave before that reality, that truth, and that there is a way for us to do the things in the right order, in which we need to trust the Lord, we need to trust Jesus before we think on doing anything whether it's serving the Lord in the ministry full-time or just serving in the place where the Lord has placed in us, where either it is our work or we are in, in, the, in the college or wherever we are. We are to manage the way the Lord tells us what's the order of the things. And that's how we can understand that God is leading us to the purpose in our lives, once that we understand these, these things that shapes us so we can honor him in the way we approach him and do the things in the right way. That same thing happened in my marriage. I end up, as I told you, having to um, propose to Stephanie a second time, having all my relatives, my most important relatives in, in the same place, asking, asking her to marry me, and then getting married six months after that happened. Because in the first time, there was, uh, it was already two years that passed since the first time that I proposed her. And now we have nine years of marriage, two beautiful kids, and we continue to thrive and, and dream to serve the Lord. And I think that's one of the things that you see as, is a consequence of doing the things according to how the Lord teaches you uh, as uh, in the way, uh, as long as you continue to learn all His ways and, and continue to to honor who he is and the things he likes the things to be done. So let's not forget that. Let's not forget that sometimes whenever we want to do something that has the spiritual title, we need to, to be aware of our own selves because the problem is within us. The problem is not with the thing that we do in fact in itself, because it might be a holy thing to do. But we need to know that we continue struggling with the sinful nature that we must surrender and always listen God to do it in the right way. Whether if it's something very clear or something that sometimes has a lot of grace and it's very hard to determine which one is the right or best way to, to follow. All right. Let's continue in prayer and thank the Lord for this moment that we just had. Dear and faithful Father, we thank you so much for bringing up uh, all of us to your word and to being able to deepen in your scripture, deepen in the words that you had the intention to teach us so much, to reveal yourself toward, towards us, Lord. 
Thank you because we have all the revelation being given to us and we also just want to to express our gratitude that we can hold all the effort, all the desire that so many invest in bringing this to accomplishment and we can know your your will and understand uh, all what you wanted us to understand from you, Lord. Please help us to, to remain faithful to you, to always seek your will in the right way, understanding your holiness and that you have a proper in the right order for us to do the things so we can see the, the, the end and the term of things in which you have prepared for each one of us in our lives and ministries and whatever you have for each one of us, Lord. Please keep, continue blessing our lives so we can also pour that blessing over others and that they may know who you are and experience the same amazing relationship we have with you, Lord. In Christ Jesus, we pray these things. Amen.